Okay. Uh, good morning and a welcome to this, the sixth meeting of 2015 of the European and External Relations Committee. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones are switched off, please? Um, agenda item one. We have very, very uh, tight time scale this morning with two evidence sessions. Agenda item one this morning is the Scottish Government's EU engagement and its priorities. And I'd like to welcome back to committee uh, Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Ex Europe and External Affairs, Fiona Hislop. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning. And her trusty hand, Colin Emery, who is the Deputy Director and Head of Europe and UK Relations at the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary, I believe you've got some opening remarks. Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, committee. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, much has happened, I think, since I, I was last in front of the committee. Uh, clearly, we've now got a new European Commission in place. Encouragingly, we uh, have a first vice president in charge of delivering uh, better regulation, uh, which is a key issue uh, which we have argued for in our proposals for revitalising and refining the European Union. Uh, the Commission has also issued its work programme for 2015, on which uh, Hamza Youssef wrote to you earlier this year. The programme is aimed at taking forward the EU 2020 agenda in the pursuit of smart, sustainable and inclusive economic growth. And that agenda fits well, actually, with our own programme for government and Scotland's economic strategy, which was launched last week. We've committed to making um, substantial revisions to our own European Action Plan, first published in 2009. And I'm grateful to members uh, for meeting with Hamza Youssef to feed in their own thoughts on what the plan needs to cover. And we aim to launch the plan on a digital platform at the end of the month. Uh, later today, the First Minister and I will meet with the Latvian ambassador. Uh, the Scottish Government and the Latvian Government are also, uh, also hosted a market awareness seminar in Edinburgh to explore the opportunity to deepen trade and investment links between our countries. Um, the Latvian EU presidency has three overarching themes, a, a competitive Europe, a digital Europe and an engaged Europe, and I will leave that to the ambassador to explain the detail of these priorities. But I just want to touch on a few particularly critical issues uh, for Scotland. A key dossier for Scotland on competitive Europe is the European Fund for Strategic Investment, or what's known as the Juncker uh, package, a €21 billion Euro loan guarantee fund that is seeking to leverage a to total of €315 billion Euros to kick-start growth through investment in shovel-ready projects across the European Union. Now, the EU has already established a pipeline of projects, and Scotland currently has four propositions on this lengthy list, covering a renewable grid infrastructure, life sciences, innovation and smart cities. And work is ongoing to both to develop these proposals further and to better understand how the fund will work in practice. The general approach to the investment plan for Europe was agreed at Ecofin on Tuesday and we are hoping that the European Council will agree the package in March of this year with the European Parliament signing it off in June. Uh, following representations by Hamza Youssef at the Joint Ministerial Committee on Europe last week, the UK Government has now set up a cross-government working group to help ensure that Scotland can benefit from the funding package. On digital Europe, uh, Scotland has ambitious goals to deliver world-class digital infrastructure, which will require hybrids of fixed fibre and mobile networks across Scotland. And meeting that aim will require continuing reform of the EU telecommunications market, including the abolition of roaming charges. And it will also require EU funding and state aid frame frameworks to be responsive and flexible enough to support investment in digital infrastructure that will enable all areas of Scotland to participate fully in digital Europe. And on the third item of an engaged Europe, um, I know that Europe, the committee and many, many members of the public have taken a keen interest in the TTIP negotiations. I welcome the steps the Commission has taken to be more transparent on TTIP. I uh, hope it will go far, as far as possible to communicate and engage with citizens across Europe on the negotiations. And whatever the economic opportunities and challenges of TTIP for Scotland, it is essential that our, our and the public's concern about the impact on, of TTIP on the NHS is addressed. As you know, we've been pressing the UK Government and the European Commission on this point. Uh, we believe that the best way to address our concerns and those of the public is firstly to have an explicit exemption for the National Health Service in the agreement and secondly to have absolute clarity that although the UK is the member state, any decisions that it takes in the context of TTIP, such as opening up the NHS in England uh, to more private providers, in no way interferes with the Scottish Government's and Scottish Parliament's own devolved uh, responsibilities. 
and uh, convener, I look forward to the outcome of your own uh, committee's TTIP inquiry. Uh, the Scottish Government looks forward to engaging with Latvia for the remainder of its presidency. However, uh, our overarching EU priority going forward will be to make a credible and proactive case for Scotland and the UK remaining in the EU. And I hope that the committee and indeed this parliament might also play a role in that. Um, I've been heartened to see other governments in the EU willing to make this case. The commitment of the Irish government in particular has been consistent, a commitment it again underlined during my trip to Dublin last month. Uh, since having the referendum debate, we have seen a substantially higher level of support for EU membership in Scotland than the rest of the UK. A recent Chatham House report found support in Scotland for remaining in the EU is now a remarkable 19 points higher than two years ago. That strong support for members is why the Scottish Government believes that, the UK, for, that for the UK to leave the EU, it should require not just a, a majority across the whole UK, but a majority in each constituent part of the UK in England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland, a double majority, and I would welcome the Parliament's support for this proposal. The Scottish Government has a, a clear view of the benefits of our EU membership, in particular the economic value of Scotland's EU membership is clear, and it places Scotland in the world's largest economy and trading area, capable of competing with advanced economies across the globe and we have unimpeded access to 500 million uh, consumers and it's a vital export market for Scottish firms accounting for almost half of Scotland's international exports in 2013 and that's worth £12.9 billion each year and that's worth, worth repeating I think. So we welcome the social, the cultural and the economic benefits that migration from the EU delivers to Scotland's communities and the right of freedom of movement is also a huge benefit to Scots who move to live and study and work elsewhere in the EU. The best way uh, to tell the positive story of EU membership is, of course, to tell the individual stories of people, of businesses and sector benefits. And that is what, that, what the Scottish Government intends to do going forward. I would uh, welcome the committee's uh, support for that endeavour. Thank you, convener. Thank you very, very much, Cabinet Secretary. Very comprehensive and, and overarching view of the, the work that the, the government's doing. Um, in, you mentioned in your opening remarks the Juncker's investment package and you said that uh, Minister Hamza Youssef had raised some concerns around that. One of the topics that this committee um, keeps a watchful brief over is Horizon 2020 um, and there's been some confusion you know, around how that funding um, is maybe being changed or um, less accessible for universities. Um, I just wonder if, if you've got any detail to I expand on that. And be be before I, um, I let you back in to answer that question, um, can I just congratulate the Scottish Government on signing the People's N NHS uh, pledge on uh, TTIP uh, for a specific exemption into the um, a NHS services uh, and any TTIP agreement. I've been working very closely with that organisation, I have to say. They were very gladdened to see that not only did the Scottish Government sign up, but many parties across uh, this Parliament signed up because they view the NHS as, as one of our crown jewels and should, should be protected. Uh, just on that last point, I think the committee has played an important role and I think the evidence sessions you've had on TTIP has actually been very balanced, um, has, I think, shone a light on the area and I think helped uh, in terms of edu information education. Yeah. But clearly there's some political um, uh, concerns and I think it's important that the committee and the parliament and uh, the contribution of the government uh, has a voice from Scotland on this. So thank you for your contributions to that. Um, the, the issue on the Juncker package um, you know, is a serious one. Our understanding um, on the horizon 2020 is one, it was one of the few uh, budget lines that had substantial increase. Yeah. It was one that uh, I know that during my time in representing the Scottish Scottish Government and the GMC Europe, um, we were very insistent that Horizon 2020 was an important um, area for the UK Government in its negotiations on the budget to push very hard. Um, we were pleased at the result that Horizon 2020 was in a strong position. Uh, clearly, in the past, um, the Scottish universities in particular had achieved great results from uh, similar uh, packages in the past. What's, uh, what we understand to be happening is um, the uh, the, the Commission have identified Horizon 2020 as a source of £2.7 billion pounds worth of reallocation to the EU budget, uh, you know, underpinning the, um, the, uh, the, you know, the, the European Fund for Strategic Investment, um, the Juncker package. 
So that's where the concerns are. You know, if we lose out on the Yunker package, that means that we could have a double. You know, that would be, could be a double whammy. Uh, however, that's the negative view of things. If you take a more positive view of things, there's there's no reason why uh, we we can't take best advantage of the Yunker package. Now, in terms of uh, what the UK has said to us and which would reflect Scotland as well. We have a fairly mature market in terms of being able to generate private investment for, uh, in addition to uh, public investment in a number of different areas, in particular in infrastructure, compared to perhaps the rest of the UK. So that would necessarily put us probably in a reasonably adv advantageous position compared to elsewhere. However, that can't be guaranteed. Um, but it's really important, therefore, that uh, we identify some of those areas that we can work together on. Now, if you think about the, the areas I talked about, interconnectors, certainly the, the role of our um, academics in terms of some of the work that needs to be involved in that, in terms of how we uh, link the islands to the mainland and facilitate expansion of renewable energy, that whole area is redolent with opportunity. Digital healthcare, again, an area where Scotland is well placed, and it's one of the areas in terms, for example, of our, our Nordic plan that we're, Baltic Nordic uh, plan that we're putting together or we have put together that's again an interest with other countries there and um, in terms of being able to do uh, you know activity in that area innovation platform again if you look at the scottish uh, economic strategy launched just last week innovation and indeed internationalization yeah. are key parts of it and smart cities i mean just yesterday uh, we met with the uh, the, the Danish ambassador, one of the areas when I was in Copenhagen, was looking at livable cities, how you know how we can exchange uh, knowledge, information, and right developments there. But I, I think it, it, it's a challenge, uh, undoubtedly. I think it's worth keeping very close monitoring on, and it's something that the, the committee may want to, to to keep a close eye on as well. Yeah, I think we're going to speak to Scotland Europa and get um, that side of the, the story as well, and trying to try to put it all together and, and keep on top of it. Going to open questions, Jamie McGregor. Um, thank you very much. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, the, the, most, uh, the, the, the Scottish Government's action plan on European engagement dates back to 2009, uh, when Mike Russell was the Minister. So it's probably due refreshment. Um, uh, now, when the Minister for Europe and International Development spoke informally to the Committee uh, about the ongoing process of refreshing the EU election plan, he suggested that it was too narrowly focused at the moment. And I remember some time ago, um, I asked uh, why agriculture was not covered, because you know, with, with the CAP being so important, um, it's actually taking up such an enormous amount of the budget, and, and the fact that agriculture is enormously important to Scotland, it, it, it seems odd that it's not covered in there. Um, and I suppose my, uh, the... Uh, what do you consider the Scottish Government's main achievement um, in terms of its EU engagement under the action plan? Uh, well, a couple of things on that. You'll, you'll recall, because obviously um, Mr McGregor is a, a long-standing member of this committee, that on an annual basis I've basically provided an update on what we've done with the action plan, but also in wider areas, and continually there's you know, probably most intense activity and indeed the most regular attendance at uh, councils have been on um, agriculture in, in particular, and obviously uh, one of the key areas in some of the budget negotiations that went on in relation to that area. But in particular, in relation to the action plan, it's right that we refresh it. We're going to do it within the context. We've now launched the Scottish um, Economic Strategy. Internationalisation is one of the four key areas, along with innovation and inclusive growth um, in, in, in uh, the economic strategy. Um, I'm also taking forward the refresh of the international framework, which we've informed the committee about. So the European Action Plan, it's a suite that's all going to sit together, as it should do. So it also covers how we might, can take forward um, the programme for government of prosperity, of um, inclusive, um, inclusive, uh, inclusive growth, and tackling inequalities, and thirdly, also in community empowerment and public services. So the idea is to make sure everything is aligned, which is quite, you know, that's what's probably happened previously. Uh, you do, uh, whether it's an individual country plans or the European Action Plan would have, would have appeared separately um, as, as our government developed it after 2007. So what you will see now is a far more cohesive, joined up approach and including um, the uh, web-based approach, which I think, in my understanding, you're keen to make sure that there's some sort of practical, practical help embedded in that, but that can be through the web-based approach can point people. The specific points about achievements under the current um, EU action plan, I think a marine energy, um, that's a key area where we've uh, 
uh, proved and secured leadership um, in terms of that area, um, in, inclusive uh, in, in the European aspect. A very practical example of that, that resulted in the chairmanship of one of the work streams of the European Ocean Energy Forum. Now, for Scotland to then uh, have a secure chairmanship, that's a, a major achievement. That includes a number of uh, member states and others, and it's been working to, to recognise marine energy as a strategic technology and um, some of the emission reduction areas also in this area. So that was an important area. The Vanguard Initiative, um, again, one where we've been working with other like-minded Substates to deliver economic growth through development of enterprise-driven smart specialisation strategies. We've delivered two um, expert working groups in Brussels around smart manufacturing and on scoping on advanced manufacturing uh, expertise, which Scotland has used the SMAS uh, area that those of you working on the in the enterprise uh, area will be familiar with. On climate change, um, particularly between. Uh, 2011 in terms of um, the uh, meetings we've had with climate change ministers from a range of countries it's usually taking place in the margins of an environmental uh, environment council a very good and practical example of coordination with uk ministers i think i've said that to the committee before it's one of the areas where actually we've, you know, we've got a good relationship in terms of how we can work in a coordinated factor um, and we also attended as part of the uk delegation the um this the, the cop 19 in warsaw in december 13 uh, given access to european ministers coordination meetings and we hope to target climate change engagement um, in the run-up to the Paris Climate Summer, uh, Summit in December. On the National Reform Programme, actually, our, um, in terms of Scotland has submitted its own proposals on that in relation to the EU 2020 strategy and a response to the midterm in that, which I think has been important. Um, we've also, in terms of the deepening engagement, we've signed memorandum with the, the French. I signed one of the, the memorandum myself. Uh, we also had it on education. In relation to the Nordic Baltic policy statement, we've had far more intensive uh, discussions and connections on the Nordic side. And I suppose the other part of it um, uh, is influence. And I think in your other aspects of the committee's work, you've heard from other, um, other countries where they've been looking at the, the point about a lot of the European policy. It's about networks, relationships and influence. Uh, we've provided the common to both the European Commission and rotating EU presidencies in the fields of climate change, fisheries management and environment, uh, and a further member of staff has been seconded to the Latvian presidency. So that's, there's more than that, but that probably gives you an area in the areas of, you know, we talked about climate change, marine energy. And I suppose one of the areas that's really, really been of political importance is the opt-out in the Lisbon Treaty and the... Um, on, on the justice issues and uh, this committee uh, uh, and the, the parliament has taken interest but that's involved a great deal of activity and work because obviously our, our, our justice system and in fact um, Paul Wheelhouse is at the European Council on Justice and Home Affairs as we speak today and tomorrow. Right, thank you for that. Um, will the, um, the refreshed action plan differ from the current version much? Well, I think your criticism is that you know, does it allow flexibility to move another priority? Because it wasn't that we weren't working on agriculture, absolutely, and I've, I've given you a, a range of areas. Uh, what it will do is align better with the, Scot the, the government's, uh, this, well, Scotland's economic strategy launched last week, and indeed the international framework that will also be um, launched, uh, we hope, towards the end of the, the month. We'll look at more about the Scotland's place in, in Europe and our strategic priorities. We'll look more about, look more probably in the plan about the influencing and engaging aspects, which again you're seeing coming through in part of your evidence on uh, Scotland's international engagement um, and those partnerships within the EU. And I think there's probably the areas where we'll kind of focus on will not necessarily be portfolio subjects, but how we approach things. So investing in our people and infrastructure, well, that's clearly on the kind of uh, the skills training, youth employment areas, for example, but also, as we discussed on the Juncker package in relation to infrastructure. Um, fostering a culture of innovation, that's where actually pursuing the Horizon 2020 funds uh, in a whole variety of areas, whether it's marine climate change or indeed uh, agriculture. And thirdly, uh, promoting inclusive gro growth and creating opportunity. And that's probably more where the... There has to be a political, I think, a political realignment within the Europe that they have to focus on, focus on jobs and recovery and what it makes a difference to people's lives. And I think you're starting to see that agenda better articulated under this commission than perhaps previously. Thank you. Um, can I continue? Um, the, referring to the um, Scottish Government's European of, uh, Union office, um, one thing I'd like to know is... Um, can you provide any examples of how the Scottish Government's Brussels office um, um, interacts with European institutions? And 
How much does it cost to run? I don't know if you know that. Give you the cost, if you can find the cost. <laughs> in terms of the um, uh, in, in terms of the interaction on a continual and regular basis, um, particularly with perm reps um, of the different countries, and indeed, actually referring to the Latvian presidency, we hosted an event, um, a cultural event, just last week, for, uh, where the majority of the Latvian um, uh, perm uh, representatives were there. But also on a whole range of issues. I mean, for example, when I visit. Um, they've helped in, engage uh, the Commission. We've met commissioners. Indeed, one of the things I think is worth reflecting is immediately on the, on the establishment of the new Commission, we wrote to all the commissioners from a portfolio basis from Cabinet Secretaries. We've had very good follow-up. They're keen to, to follow up. And uh, there'll be a number of meetings set up between our um, Cabinet Secretaries and Ministers with the European Commission commissioners as, um, as the Commission develops. So with the Commission itself, but also with other institutions and other countries that are there on different areas, we host events. Events. We've had Margaret Burgess, for example, speak at one of the events on an international event on on, um, te on tenants and tenants' rights. Again, that's something where you're know, established by uh, you, you, European institutions where we participate. So sometimes we lead, but sometimes engagement. There's a the role of the Brussels office is is absolutely about facilitation, but also an engagement with um, uh, and the with with the Scottish government back home in relation to making sure we maximise all the portfolio areas. Areas, so that all the areas of government, whether it's education or whether it's on justice or whether it's on enterprise, can access the institutions that they have. In terms of cost, it's just over a million pounds in total. Um, I, but it's absolutely vital that we do this. And we've pro in fact, interestingly, we've provided advice for other countries and other administrations looking to, to, to set up um, in Brussels as well, because it's really important to be there. Colin, do you want to say anything else on that? Or? Um, yeah, and, I mean, in terms of the of the office's uh, role, it is uh, it's formally part of the UK representation, so it has a very close working relationship with the UK, and therefore works alongside them in council working groups and others to make sure that the particular Scottish issues uh, are fully reflected in, in the UK line. And uh, it, in that context, uh, also it works directly with the institutions. I mean. And the Cabinet Secretary mentioned the marine energy work. Actually, that was led from the Brussels office, uh, which, because of its presence on the spot, was able to use its ability to, to, to actually coordinate meetings with a, of a member state group of eight. So a great, it's a great facility, and it works also next to Scotland Europa in the same building. So it's, that provides the opportunity for Scottish institutions, businesses, and others to actually work directly with the government. And it's also right in, it's very helpfully right in the centre, looking uh, across the square at the main commission building, the Burley Mall, and that's a very good way to get access. Can I just uh, maybe ask, I think you've, you've visited the Brussels offices as a committee, haven't you? Yeah. Um, lastly, fi finally, um, do, the, uh, does the uh, Scottish Government's European Union engagement, especially post-referendum, uh, a dovetail with the United Kingdom's engagement in Brussels? Uh, I think we're a bit more positive <laughs> in terms of our outlook on Europe. We, we recognise the importance of reform, um, uh, and in terms of our position, uh, you know, yes, it does dovetail, but of course the proposal for an in-out referendum, as, as the member will know, is not a position of the current UK government. The, the uh, position of um, proposal for an in-out referendum is one of the leader um, of the Conservative Party, um, uh, and should he be re-elected, uh, that's, that's part of his proposal. So because it's not part of the UK government's official policy, it allows more latitude for us to express our views, which I have done in terms of um, a more positive view about uh, continuing EU membership. But uh, to, to reassure you, it makes more sense, and I've said this repeatedly, there's probably more coordination and cooperation than you necessarily know, because what you would tend to, to hear about in terms of media is when there are disagreements, and of which there are on occasion, but some of the coordination I've talked about around Environment Council in particular, you know, we've got a very strong reputation. It means that we can talk to other environment ministers across um, across Europe, and when you're dealing with obviously the volume of people to, to, to influence, doing that on a coordinated basis with the UK is very important indeed. And certainly on the Juncker pa package, I'm absolutely. Uh, 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 
clear that we need to maximise what we can get from that. And, uh, and indeed, um, Hamza Yusuf will be taking forward the joint ministerial committee uh, committees with Europe going forward. But we have made it uh, quite clear that we can work in coordination with that to make sure that we can maximise our, our impact. So I think it's unfortunate um, that we are seeing the UK increasingly becoming distanced and dis detached. And that's the message I, I'm getting consistently um, from Europe. So therefore, its influence is less. Um, you, we have to make sure that we, we continue to be positive and in terms of uh, engagement, that we have something to offer and to be a constructive voice in this. And that's what we will continue to do. Okay, I've got Anne and then Adam. Yeah, thank you. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I'm still running on the theme of the European Union office. Can I ask um, your Cabinet Secretary to provide an example of how the Scottish Government's Brussels office monitors policy developments of relevance to Scotland? Oh, and on a continuous and regular basis, that's a, a vast majority of, of what they do. But part of what we're trying to do is to make sure that it doesn't all have to be done um, in the Brussels office is actually a lot of the monitoring of development should be happening within each de government department area, whether it's in education, whether it's in other areas. So um, that's on a, continu a, a continual basis. Um, and I think that's the challenge, is the volume of material that, that, and the majority of developments. So prioritising is really important, which is why having our own um, action plan in terms of what our focus is helps direct them as to what they do spend more time on than in other areas. But there are areas that we, you know, we really have to because... Uh, we have to comply. We've got a good record. And again, we've developed over recent years the monitoring mechanism by we have the implementation of regulations. But in areas such as agriculture, absolutely extensive, but also in areas of justice and home affairs, particularly with the recent opt-outs, absolutely critical that we're, you know, we're on top of what's there and that's what they, they do. But anything else you want to perhaps offer, Colin? In terms of the, of the, of the Brussels office, I mean, we have a representative from Marine Scotland, who's there given a very strong fisheries interest, who actually sort of leads our engagement, making sure he's able to support ministers when they're at, at councils in that regard. We have, a, we have a, one of our senior officers focuses very much on the agriculture and environment portfolios, given their importance to Scotland, given the fact that these decisions have to be implemented uh, and cover most of our agriculture and environmental policy. And then we have a very strong focus on the whole investment uh, and innovation uh, agenda uh, alongside, our, alongside the Justice and Home Affairs. So effectively, we've got a team there who act as, to some extent, the eyes and ears of the teams back at home, but they can only operate effectively if they can link into ministers and into the officials in the, in the departments in Edinburgh and Glasgow. And there's a regular movement of ministers are regularly in Brussels, and I'm, as part of my role, and also in terms of use of encouraging all ministers to, to, uh, to uh, you know, be in Brussels and go to as many councils as they can and to en engage as fully as they can. Obviously, parliamentary business here requires them um, to, to vote, etc. So uh, sometimes they can't maybe attend as often as possible. But I, mean, I was very pleased, for example, in terms of the cooperation that Jamie McGregor talked about, that uh, Andrew Constance, when she was the Youth Employment Minister, led for the UK at one of the councils in one of the areas, because again, that's an area that people are very interested in our work we, you know, in terms of youth employment being uh, one of the administrations <laughs> that really focuses on that and that's in keeping actually with some of the developments that are taking place so that's another area where we can help lead um, and, and do so in cooperation but also um, and where we can we, where we can influence other countries as well and learn more mm -hmm. which is an important part of it thank you thank you adam uh, thank you convener uh, good morning cabinet secretary um, <clears throat> um i'd like to ask some of the get down to some of the nitty-gritty questions uh, with regards to jobs and economic growth. You mentioned the support for the European Union in Scotland, and I would suggest that's largely based on the economic benefits of membership of the EU, as opposed to the, the political uh, debates that uh, are happening elsewhere. Um, yesterday in the uh, chamber, John Swinney indicated we wanted to, uh, the Scottish Government had a target of growing exports by 50%. Could I ask um, how you, the refreshed EU action plan uh, will push that agenda forward? What, what are we going to change to achieve that, that particular objective? 
Um, well, that's why the alignment, obviously, with the, um, the Scotland's economic strategy launched last week is critical, because you've got, particularly, if, as I mentioned, uh, focus on innovation and internationalisation. Um, in terms of uh, the point about the importance, you know, over 300,000 jobs are in Scotland are dependent on companies that uh, have the EU as a market. Um, in terms of the size of it, uh, you know, we also have uh, an important part about the foreign direct investment that comes in, mm -hmm. and that's an area for exports as well in terms of how we can then connect. It's not just about what comes in, it's what can go out as well, and there's an interesting discussion we've had, I've had recently with different countries that are interested in investing here so they can then export from here using the innovation technology skills base that we have, because remember that's our strength. And that goes back to some of the issues around Horizon 2020. Innovation is really important. People want to invest here because they can then um, the, the, they can then uh, export elsewhere. Um, a good example, um, and, and again, it's how there's an interlinking between the skills investment, etc. I met with JSK when I was in Dublin, who've got major investments in um, in Irvine, but also in Montrose. And one of the things that they said to me was to thank me for when I was cabinet secretary for education for introducing a two for one life science apprenticeship. Um, there was lots of other factors that made them invest, and they've invested over a hundred million pounds in these plants in recent years. But they knew that we were committed. We were committed to skills, and uh, 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 an investment in people will help innovation, which comes back to this inclusive growth agenda. Uh, it's actually about um, how we can um, how we can improve productivity and output by actually recognising inclusive growth, which means investing in young people and in women and in other areas. So that's a kind of maybe, a, when, I told, when I said that telling the stories of individual companies and individuals can actually help argue the case for, for Europe, that's one example. There's also an issue around um, internationalisation is not just about an export focus for its own transactional trade aspect. Uh, companies that are exposed to international activity are more likely to be innovative as well because they learn elsewhere. Um, one of the areas that I know Richard Lockhead is very keen on, uh, we've, we've had great figures on food and drink, but we can do more. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you know, w that's going to be a, a, a big opportunity for us um, in developing um, the market, particularly in Europe. So I think part of it is we've got to think about it. It's not just about exports to Europe. It's actually using the European... Um, uh, investment to help us grow our internationalisation uh, within Scotland of our companies so they can export not just to Europe but beyond Europe. So I think that's that's where we're going to um, see the linkages. So is there any way we're going to engage in a, a different fashion to try and push um, push ahead with these with these particular well, objectives? Well, I mean, I, I, again, a very practical um, thing that will come out from the. Uh, the economic strategy, which I've also been involved in from the uh, international portfolio, is ensuring that we have a one Scotland partnership across the world. That's, you'll see that very heavily in our international framework, but also um, uh, international innovation. You know, the idea of in innovation investment hubs and location of them will allow us then to better corral and, 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 and bring together all the agencies from Scotland that can help promote that export agenda. So they are practical things that are in the economic strategy which will be a part of the European Action Plan and will also be part of our overarching international framework. So um, that, that's a, a very key focus on, on trade and investment. But it's not just about the transactional aspect. The innovation is key and that's where actually the added value from Scotland if we can mobilise our activity around Horizon 2020. Because remember it's SMEs that we need to get uh, exporting more as well. Um, that's going to be one of the kind of key tricks for us. Good, thank you. Thank you very much, Anzala. Um, good morning, good morning. Cabinet Secretary, and welcome to our committee on a sunny morning. Is it? Uh, <laughs> you've had an opportunity to visit the US, and you, you, you plan to, to visit them again um, in the future. With that experience... Sorry, uh, can you want to repeat that? Sorry. Yes, of course. The, 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 the welcome and, or the actual question. <laughs> oh, well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well... Let me, let me formally welcome you again to this uh, sunny morning. And uh, I, I was just saying that uh, you've had an opportunity to visit the U.S. and you, you're planning other visits as well. Uh, so with that experience, uh, how fact flexible do you think the Scottish government's uh, EU action plan is in response to the emergency policies, for example, the TTIP? Well, it, it can be and it will be. I mean, and, and that's why I think actually a focus more on ensuring that we've got a better focus on relationships, network, partnerships, engagement is, is critical. I mean, not having... Obviously, you know, TTIP wasn't in the European Action Plan of 20. 
2009 because obviously that was being uh, developed, but it hasn't stopped us responding to it. Similarly, in terms of the European, uh, you know, the, the priorities from this committee will not have had TTIP in, in previous years. So you've adapted to circumstances as they arise. Um, and that's what the priorities are. And I think that's one of the things that's really important is coordinating across government um, how we do that. I certainly do that um, uh, with Cabinet colleagues, but also um, Hamza Youssef brings together and uh, the ministers with particular interests um, on European matters, whether it's in public health, whether it's in rural areas, whether it's in um, with the enterprise to make sure that we can be uh, cited across interests, but also if there's an emerging uh, political imperative for us all to coordinate in one area, we'll be able to do that a bit more nimbly, which is what I think everybody expects us to do. Yes, um, I think the, the $6 million question really is that although we have now amended our, our, our action plan, what I would, I would be really interested in knowing is, is this going to be a working document for us, or are we going to be stuck for this for a for a, a period of time? Um, because as as we quite clearly have seen from experience, that uh, Europe and TTIP in particular is is quite a a, um, a changing, developing scene, and I'm just wondering how does that set us in responding to that, um, and what the time frames are for that response. I think that's a very important point. I mean, the European Action Plan will sit um, as part of our international framework, which in itself will sit within uh, the wider economic strategy as well. Um, and in terms of the European Action Plan, as with the international framework, we want it to be able to, to be a more of a live document. That's why we're web-based. It's why it will be regularly updated. Uh, there are policy statements and positions you might take on an annual basis, which are provided back, which you know, there's movements, uh, but the, the plan should allow people to be aligned in what their focus is, but allow a responsiveness. And it needs to be more interactive, so it'll be more of a live document than, say, um, what, you know, a document that was produced by a minister in 2009 that kind of you know, you might have got an annual you know, written update, but this is going to be far more interactive. Mm. And it also provides that portal, which I think you were looking for in your discussions about how people who are interested in access. It's not the beyond end of, obviously, Scott Europa, different organisations have an important platform, but we'll be able to try and link to the relevant areas that can help provide positions. But it means that it can be more evolving. Um, and it's also important that it, it provides a kind of, it'll be a, a go-to area for information, but also... Any comment, speeches, uh, developments that take place, we can also access that and put it on. So it'll be, that's the, the shape it will be. Just finally on this, um, in terms of the office in Brussels, do we have somebody who's actually going to be responsible to make sure that we actually deliver that uh, more actively rather than just have it on, on the web itself? Do we have... Or pass this over to the person responsible. Apart <laughs> 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 from myself. <laughs> Yes, I mean, the answer is one of the great advantages of where we are now in terms of where we were then is that now we have a clear set of priorities for the next five years that were set by the European Council uh, and the Commission yes. last summer. And we also have a very clear set of priorities from Scotland and the new economic strategy. So the, our aim is to make sure that both are aligned and that we use that as the framework for taking it forward. And, in fact, the preparation of the action plan is something being done jointly by the team in Edinburgh and the team in Brussels yeah. which support the Cabinet Secretary. So we will we'll be endeavouring to make sure that it is taken forward actively and that the reports that are done and the updates that are done can reflect the situation as it develops. So I've got strategic uh, responsibility for our, our European and external affairs activities. Uh, Hamza Yusuf will take forward particularly relations with the UK domestically. I'll be carrying out more of our bilateral relationships, so that's at a political level. Yes. And we'll also coordinate with colleagues. Um, in terms of the civil service, uh, Colin is the deputy director and responsible for uh, European and UK relations and spends a considerable amount in, of time in Brussels and with the Brussels team. So that's why I definitely thought it would be helpful to, to oh, you. You know, you know where the responsibility lies as well. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Okay, Rod Campbell. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning. Um, if I may, I'd just like to refer to a couple of issues. One is, uh, obviously, I'm pleased that Paul Wheelhouse is in Brussels today. In terms of that trip and visit, uh, is it possible to get some kind of feedback fed through to this committee, or what would be the plan? 
Uh, I'm just trying to think what we would normally do. I mean, obviously, the, the issues that we're there will be particularly of interest to the, the uh, Justice Committee, and I'm not. I think that's something we should maybe discuss with your, with yourselves and the, and the clerks as to um, how we can update, how we update. I, I obviously, or it will now be uh, Hamza Yusuf will update you. Um, following GMC Europe uh, discussions, they tend to be done to the committee of subject. And again, yeah. this committee has been trying to encourage all the subject committees to be more proactive in that European agenda. I would be a bit reluctant to, to change that and have this committee as being the only place that reports come back to. But um, certainly, if there's a readout of that, I'll, I'll make sure yeah. this committee I, I, on that I, one. I certainly explains. wasn't suggesting that, Cabinet Secretary. I obviously wear two hats because I'm on the Justice Committee uh, and then the European Rapporteur. But yeah. Yeah. I'm a, yeah. Yeah. And actually, I'm yeah. assuming that you will get you get reg, um, updates on council activity from time to time from ministers, or do you request that as a committee member? Uh, it doesn't necessarily formally form part of the agenda. Obviously, I don't want to step on anyone's toes, but it seems to me that kind of both committees are kind of interested in, in, in this issue. But uh, we could yeah. certainly look about how because it, it, it's kind of how to make sure it's done yeah. on a meaningful basis that you're not overloaded yeah. with information you can't necessarily or, or won't necessarily need to work with. And without cre creating a bureaucratic administrative yeah. burden on everybody, so we can concentrate on getting things done. But it's something we can look at, and maybe yeah. some feedback from the committee as to, you know, if you, I, I suspect actually talking to your European re rapporteurs in each of your committees as to how things are working in terms of knowing what's happening. Bearing in mind we've now got a new ministerial team, it's probably yeah. not an unreasonable time to have a kind of refresh as to how that works and works well. Okay. But I would caution against over bureaucracy is the yeah. only thing okay. I, would, I would say. Fine. Can I move on to my, my next point then? My second point is just really um, how kind of, given the, the Latvian presidency of the EU, and we'll shortly be hearing from the Latvian ambassador, um, the Latvian priorities, how, how that fitted uh, with uh, the Scottish Government's own agenda. I was particularly interested in the, the third Latvian <coughs> Council Party, Engage Europe, which touches on, uh, obviously, concerns about uh, uh, conflicts on their doorstep. Um, uh, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Um, you know, I, I think an Engage Europe is really critical. It's part of our proposals on a reformed Europe as well that we put forward. And it is that, uh, that I, concentration on making sure that Europe is addressing the issues of concern. I think jobs is most definitely one of them. I think security um, is another, particularly in, uh, either in energy or indeed in, in, in uh, security of, of, of impoverished <coughs> countries. Um, it's also uh, an area that obviously those countries that are to the east of Europe have, have serious concerns about. Indeed, um, the Lithuanians, when they were in presidency, also uh, did a great deal of concentration on the European partnerships. Whether Europe um, acted and functioned uh, as engaged as it should have been engaged is, is two-way. Engaged is engaged with your internal citizens, um, which is a, a key aspect, I think, of what the Latvians want to pursue. But also, um, I think there is a clear focus for European uh, external affairs policy now led by um, the High Representative Mogherina. And, and in terms of the activity that she's been involved in, I think it's quite strategic. I think it's important, uh, particularly <laughs> the southern, southern borders. And I think that's the balance. And, and you heard from the Italian presidency, for example, when the ambassador was here, he was requesting that the southern, border, the, the, the southern partnership and the southern borders weren't uh, put to one side in favour of what was happening um, in relation to concerns about the East and particularly uh, in relation to Ukraine. Um, so I think that balancing act is a very hard one because it's, it, they should be able to be doing both. And you know, I've raised my concerns with the UK government. I've said it in this committee as well. You know, the Mediterranean is becoming the watery graveyard of, of Europe, and so therefore, you know, strategically long term, whether it's to do with uh, climate change and long term in the north of Africa or indeed the conflicts are there, that has to be dealt with. But at the same time, you have a presidency which should understandably be very focused and right, quite rightly on concerns to the eastern borders. And I think that's going to be the challenge for Europe going forward, is how does it make sure in terms of its European external relations policy um, it can do so in a way that addresses everybody's concerns without being too diluted to, to have a meaningful impact. Thank you. Well, I like coffee. Thanks very much, Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. The Commission has just uh, two or three weeks ago published its Digital Economy and Society Index report, and uh, in there it shows a range of kind of performance indicators of over a, so a range of digital services, if you like, and particularly in the one called Integration of Digital Services. That's the one that's the, showing the least 
progress in Europe and um, the UK, for example, is in the lower half of the performance table in terms of these types of services. It includes things like online selling and cross-border selling and things like that. What's, what's your response to the, the news that we're hearing that the UK government and other European governments have decided to backtrack on their commitment to abolish roaming charges for another three years uh, to 2018. That's been reported in the press that that's what the governments have done. And of course, that does nothing, in my view, to assist consumers and to, to help the integration of digital services. And it just makes matters worse. So what's your view on that? And what influence could the Scottish government bring to bear on that with the UK? Well, bearing in mind, uh, you know, one, our concentration on exporting, a lot of exporting will be done, uh, not just within Europe in terms of uh, using uh, digital technology, but also globally, you're seeing that market develop, which is part of that innovation and internationalisation agenda I talked about earlier. Uh, clearly, it's disappointing the UK are moving that direction because it's in our interest. We are an exporting nation. We want to be have growth through international and in innovative uh, practices. I think it's, uh, therefore, in terms, of, I suppose, if I was looking at the Latvian presidency's priorities, and obviously you can speak to the ambassador about that um, in, the, in the following session, but I think that their clear focus on a digital Europe will be really important at this time. Um, I think they could have, make a, a, a clear and distinct difference in, in driving this forward in terms of there's if, different issues around digitising the public sector, uh, safety and security issues, but also the EU's digital single market strategy is really, really important, as you've set out. And I think um, of all the, the recent presidencies, uh, uh, there's been a, a, an understanding of the clear need for this, but I do think the Latvians will be able to offer a great deal in terms of uh, leadership in this agenda, um, and I hope that they can uh, communicate that to, to the UK as, as well. Uh, and I think that that's part of our responsibility, both as ministers um, in the European area, but also uh, Keith Brown and his responsibilities in infrastructure as well, I think could, uh, we need to make sure that we are influencing the UK on a positive agenda. I hope coming out of the Westminster election, we might be in a more enlightened position in relation to the digital market from a, a, a new incoming uh, UK government. But I do think that um, that connectivity and infrastructure is critical. And it's not just a self-interest from Scotland. Europe has to do it because we're not going to compete on low-value uh, products, it's got to be high value, and that's why the digital connectivity is absolutely crucial. And in an area that I've got a keen interest in, creative industries, Scotland has a, a lot to offer, a lot to, to, to contribute. And unless we've got um, a better uh, digital framework to do that, then that will impede us in a, in a growth area. In terms of that, I mean, did, did, has the UK government uh, consulted with the Scottish government on that, that really crucial matter? Because it's been of interest to this committee, particularly. Yeah. For a number of years. It, it, unless Colin can, can, can contribute to this, I think it's, it's an area that was probably best dealt with at a portfolio level by the relevant uh, Cabinet Secretary. And on the digital infrastructure, that's um, uh, Keith Brown's responsibility. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Cabinet Secretary, I think that's exhausted our questions for you this morning. Can we thank you very much? I know that was a very condensed and intense um, evidence session, but extremely helpful uh, indeed. Um, just on behalf of the committee, can I thank you for coming along with me? We look forward to engaging with the Scottish Government's uh, European engagement strategy um, in the future. Thank you. I'm going to suspend very briefly, just to allow our um, witnesses to change over.
Okay, uh, welcome back to the uh, European External Relations Committee. Agenda item two this morning is our topic, uh, the Presidency of the Council of the European Union. And can I welcome to committee this morning His, Ex uh, His Excellency Andrus Tekmanis, who is Ambassador of the Republic of Latvia in the UK, uh, Slovega Sil. Kalna is the Deputy Head of Mission uh, at the Embassy of Latvia, and our very own John McGregor, who is the Honorary Consul of Latvia in Scotland. Could I welcome you all to our committee this morning? We're delighted to have you here, and can we thank you very much for the wonderful reception you provided us with last night, um, the fantastic music, especially the last piece, I have to say. Uh, I see Twitter went mad raving about it last night, so um, we, we're very, very grateful for that. Uh, Ambassador I believe you have uh, an opening statement you would like to give the committee this morning. Thank you. Yeah. Well, <coughs> the chairman, uh, members of committee, first uh, allow me to thank you for inviting me to your committee meeting and allowing me to share uh, our considerations on priorities of Latvian presidency in the Council of European Union. Uh, this is a very great challenge for Latvia. Eleven years after joining to EU, this is our first presidency. We have in European Union mem member countries, a number of countries who have great experience in conducting presidencies, six or nine, year, nine times, this is our first. The time has changed as well, and, and the, probably the next presidency for uh, EU member countries may come after 14 or 15 years. So it is a particular challenge. And we, as a small country, want to make our presidency efficient, uh, useful, and very much uh, reflecting the needs of the time. And that, uh, this assumption was when we <clears throat> have chosen uh, the major uh, objectives and priorities uh, of our presidency. Uh, probably the m most important task of our presidency was uh, fully overcome financial and economic crisis. And we see that we can overcome this crisis uh, being more competitive. And therefore, we have chosen three major areas. We are concentrating our efforts it is competitive Europe, digital Europe, and engaged Europe. Uh, competitive Europe uh, means creating jobs and creating and be coming back to economic growth. We see several instruments that can be helpful uh, to implement uh, this program. One is uh, Commission's plan for investments or, or Juncker plan is 315 billion euros devoted to investment package affordable for big companies, affordable for uh, small and medium-sized uh, companies. Uh, we have advanced quite, quite well in, uh, in this direction. Uh, we hope that until the end of our presidency we will be able to fully launch this plan um, last week, ECOFIN Council, no, even this week, ECOFIN Council has endorsed a strategic investment fund, and uh, Commission has also published a green paper on capital market union. That's another instrument we see as a good tool or to, uh, ac to get access to investments uh, for SMEs, for uh, any, any companies, and we, we hope very much that uh, these instruments could be a good boost for uh, recovering of uh, European economy and getting, getting back to growth, creating uh, jobs. Uh, we are caring very much on social dimension and therefore well, that's a, also a Latvian experience from, from the time when we had to overcome a uh, financial and economic crisis. Uh, one of the key factors was maintain good dialogue with social partners, and, and therefore um, 
We are also very much engaged <coughs> to keeping social dialogue with uh, in, in this tripartite summit uh, with uh, employers, with uh, trade unions. Uh, we, we are working on implementation of banking union and all the mechanisms of banking union. Uh, well, no particular new uh, approaches uh, are envisaged, but we want to launch and check how the newly created uh, structures are properly functioning. Uh, one of the key elements of competitive Europe is efficient energy policy, and here we are determined to uh, move on with creation of energy union. And again, we, we have advanced quite well. Uh, in the beginning of February in Riga, a high-level conference took place, and the energy union was discussed, and just now our uh, energy union strategy was endorsed by Energy Council, so we are we are also expecting that uh, March uh, uh, European Council will give its green light for, for energy union and then in June Council uh, already next legislative uh, acts will be uh, adopted to implement this energy union. We, we see energy union as very crucial uh, in our time, it is a part of European security, not only part of European economy. And to our vision, we see uh, energy union based on five major principles. Uh, principle of solidarity, principle of interconnected energy market, uh, an efficient common energy diplomacy, uh, competitive uh, energy ind independence, uh, diversification of sources and diversification of delivery and good governance uh, across uh, energy policy. We have quite a good experience in Baltic Sea region how good governance, how efficient, efficient governance of, of all these principles uh, is being uh, created. Uh, countries around Baltic Sea are doing very much uh, of inter, to interconnect different kind of energy sources. There are gas pipelines crossing the countries around Baltic uh, with an ultimate goal to create a common gas grid around Baltic Sea. There are electricity cables from Estonia to Finland, from Lithuania to Sweden, from Lithuania to Poland, so it keeps also, in, from Latvia to uh, uh, Estonia, well, the, it gives really uh, an efficient tool to change when necessary the flows of energy, flows of electricity, di differentiation of sources, uh, at the same time, common Baltic energy stock market, stock exchange gives an opportunity to buy in one, one exchange electricity even not knowing who is producing this electricity, and that gives a real alternative and, and real competition between uh, energy com companies. Certainly, uh, we see uh, that we are very much like minded with uh, United Kingdom in, uh, in matters of uh, development and strengthening of single market and all the regulatory framework of single market uh, so it will be one of the uh, permanent issues on competition councils and, and we, we are determined to uh, make single market uh, more efficient, more affordable and uh, a good tool to strengthen competitions among companies in the European Union. Uh, digital Europe. Digital Europe is uh, one of the key elements uh, of competitiveness, uh, and we look at uh, our digital philosophy is based on assumption that digital solutions should be found by default. That means that first we are looking for well, new challenges, how to cope with them, uh, uh, based on di digital solutions and uh, digital opportunities that it is giving for Europe enormous 
uh, opportunities for trade, uh, for, for movement of goods and services. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are thinking about uh, issues like uh, data protection, security of information systems, uh, accessibility of uh, web, uh, and of course, uh, education uh, among uh, youngsters, particularly, and on uh, cyber security strategy. All these issues we are going to discuss in during digital assembly that will take place in Riga in June 1718. Uh, there are a number of uh, quite challenging issues on this agenda. Uh, I can mention uh, a few of them, like telecommunication package, uh, that is uh, quite, um, quite a difficult uh, item because across Europe we see number of, or even great number of different actors uh, and stakeholders who, among companies and states, who have well, different interests and, and, and maybe different uh, level of, of de development in, in telecommunication sphere. And, and the discussions are not going very easy, but we want to uh, push them uh, ahead in order to get some um, affordable compromise uh, in the issues on um, roaming, and on, on telecommunication tariffs. We hope we, we, will, uh, we will advance uh, as much as, as possible and, and we won't leave too much to our uh, trio partner, Luxembourg. Uh, digital single market is, is also uh, a crucial uh, point on agenda and, and uh, it is in our interest to uh, develop as much as uh, possible digital single market bearing in mind that it should uh, safeguard uh, quality of services and uh, uh, on reasonable costs for, for customers. Uh, we, we are uh, advancing uh, network and information security uh, directive. Uh, it is a very, very crucial uh, for uh, further uh, development of digital uh, market in, in Europe uh, for protection of consumers. Uh, here we, we are also uh, working on, on data, personal data protection, um, on a program on interoperability solution for uh, European public administration. We are working on a more implementation on e-government government, uh, e-governance, e-services uh, offered by, by government, governments. Uh, so it, it is really very vast agenda and, and we are happy to share our own experience we are using in Latvia. And in Latvia, our digital services are, are using, used very much uh, solutions of digital government are used very much and and uh, well, sometime uh, the r opportunity to, to use free Wi-Fi across Latvia is, is considered by many as a part of their daily human rights. Uh, if I'm moving towards connected Europe, uh, I would uh, speak about two major points. One uh, point uh, is trade issues and, and here, uh, we are concentrating on uh, advancing uh, free trade uh, negotiations, starting with TTIP. Uh, well, there are a lot of uh, discussions around TTIP everywhere in the press, uh, in, 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 in different media, in, in, uh, among politicians. Uh, there are many questions uh, put uh, related to uh, TTIP negotiations, uh, issues like uh, GMO, uh, issues like transparency of, of uh, the negotiation process, issues whether uh, TTIP negotiations may affect uh, health services. Uh, I, well, on one hand, 
presidency is not directly involved in, in TTIP negotiations. It, it's a mandate of European Commission, of course, and, and European Commission is, is conducting these negotiations quite actively. There have been already eight negotiation rounds, and two more are envisaged during Latvian presidency. But we are trying to uh, push the whole negotiation process ahead. Uh, we are, we are um, representing uh, EU position on a different, um, different conferences, uh, global conferences, uh, uh, discussing uh, trade. Uh, and we are also uh, working on increasing transparency uh, of, of negotiations. Uh, certainly, we should keep in mind that transparency can't be one-sided. Well, we, we are not, due to transparency issues, we are not interested to weaken the positions of negotiator teams. Of course not. Well, but at the same time, if the public demand is high, see more information about, like, like uh, health service. But I think health service, uh, these issues were, questions were put and answers were given, uh, were given quite recently. Commissioner Malmström uh, was visiting uh, London and, and she quite explicitly uh, told that uh, health services are separated from, from the uh, negotiation uh, mandate of, of uh, TTIP. Uh, we, we are uh, also uh, pushing ahead uh, other free trade agreements uh, on agenda of, of Commission, uh, like, uh, well, CETA uh, agreement with Canada is already uh, approved, but it, it should be implemented, and, and we are pushing the, the process, uh, process of um, approval by, by Parliament uh, Parliament uh, of uh, this agreement. Uh, we are working uh, as well on uh, pushing ahead EU-Japan FTA, uh, FTA with Vietnam. Uh, so uh, we, we, we think that uh, these uh, negotiations, uh, although the mandate is, is very huge and, and the points are uh, very, really many, the agenda is vast, and, and of course, uh, negotiators should think about the reasonable compromise. Well, not, not at any point in such negotiations you can win, but uh, I think at the very end, the uh, Commission will do its job very properly and in interest of uh, member countries and, and uh, Europeans. Uh, another um, important area of... Um, our uh, program of Connected Europe is uh, development of European neighborhood policy, uh, neighborhood policy uh, to the southern direction and to the eastern direction. Uh, we having more uh, knowledge and experience uh, how to do uh, with uh, eastern direction, we are concentrating our efforts on uh, developing and, and advancing Eastern pol partnership policy. Uh, of European Union, uh, and we are planning to ho host in Riga Eastern Partnership Summit uh, in, in May 21-22. Uh, we hope on, on a good participation, on high-level participation uh, in this summit. Uh, not an easy time for, for convening summit, but uh, as the previous experience shows, well, Every member country having presidency is planning its own agenda, but it should be prepared also for challenging coming from not planned uh, regions or, or not planned topics. So we, we haven't particularly uh, envisaged uh, in our agenda the uh, finding solution on Greek issues. Uh, we, we neither have uh, particularly uh, planned something, uh, a crisis in Ukraine, but, but we, we are facing it and, and we should respond to this, these challenges. And, and we see that the European partnership uh, policy has, uh, since its uh, launch in, in 2007, it has become a more individual, 
Uh, although at that time all six countries were standing on the same line, and, and now after eight years we, we see that there are front runners, and there are countries that are still a little bit hesitating uh, of uh, going more deeply in the relationship with the European Union. And I find it's quite normal, it's, it's good. that Well, we see, well, we can't, instead of these countries, we can't wish to approach more closely or take over the standards of uh, European standards and values. But they have to decide themselves. And, and that's a not maybe easy political decision for them. And we, and we see now how uh, at least three countries are advancing, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, uh, they have advanced in, in matters of association agreements, in matters of, of mobility uh, agreements, uh, in, in different programs of uh, rule of law in, implementation in these countries. And there are countries like Azerbaijan, Moldova, and, and Armenia who have probably the more uh, flexible agenda. Uh, and, 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 but, but we want to uh, shape the policy towards each of these countries to make a tailor make policy to each of these countries and and uh, during the summit in Riga we want to set a new set of guidelines for the future how to move ahead in relations with with these countries um, we also want to uh, review our European uh, Central Asia strategy uh, a region that is is playing a quite a crucial role for Europe, not only uh, in, as a part of common energy policy, but we should not uh, lose it out of sight that this is a region where quite substantial energy resources are located. Uh, but this is also a region that is quite um, important for uh, Asian security policy uh, having in mind what, what's going on in, in Afghanistan, what's going on in Pakistan, what's going on in Iraq, uh, these countries are quite concerned about all, all these processes and, and, and uh, EU should work together uh, with them. And, and we, we have concentrated on three major directions in cooperation with these countries. It's uh, sustainable uh, development, uh, strengthening of rule of law and, and market uh, economy, uh, border security and education. Uh, well, these three, three directions uh, we, we think that could be uh, beneficial and uh, very useful for, for these countries as well, uh, will be beneficial for, for interests of uh, European Union. Um, we, well, the, all, all the neighborhood policies are, have a, quite a particular security dimension and, and we see how security situation in, in Europe has changed just during the last year and we should respond to these, these challenges, we should respond, respond to, to these changes uh, and therefore we have envisaged also during our presidency in, in June summit, uh, June European Council, uh, we, we should reshape and review European security strategy, a quite crucial document. Of course, we will work together with European External Action Service that will prepare this uh, revised strategy, but uh, it is essential to give a proper response on, on the new security challenging the uh, existing uh, security architecture and and security order uh, in, in Europe has changed, uh, whether we like it or not, but it has. So we, we have to find a proper response and, and uh, increase European security. Uh, of course, we, we, uh, we, we know that European security very much is based on, on strong transatlantic link, and that should be taken into account. But, but there are new challenges, well, just uh, in these days, uh, Russia has uh, stepped out of our CFE conventional uh, treaty, conventional forces treaty, uh, and that's not a good signal indeed. 
Uh, so, we, we, well, Europe need, need to find a proper response. Also, a uh, proper response by uh, finding appropriate finances for defense issues. Uh, even uh, having in mind that maybe 20 years, European politicians uh, used to live in a very uh, nice and kind conditions uh, relationship uh, among countries, and they were used to find uh, best solutions through diplomatic means, through negotiations and finding compromise. Well, we see that uh, we should not neglect current situation and we should, should assess these current situations and, and we should not forget uh, about proper financing of, of defense uh, policies as well. Uh, well, uh, I, I could, could, of course, uh, tell you much more about uh, uh, climate policy, about enlargement, um, about migra migration issues, uh, but, but, well, these all issues are on the agenda uh, of our Latvian presidency, but I'll try to save your uh, time, and, and I'll be happy to, to give a response to, to your questions. Uh, about uh, some, some particular issues, and, and thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs> thank you. That is extremely comprehensive and um, covered every topic, I think, that we, we have looked at on the committee. Uh, Willie Coffey. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, Ambassador. Um, I'd like to ask you a question on the digital single market, uh, which I was asking our Cabinet Secretary, I think, when you came in to join us at the meeting. Um, the European Commission has just published its Digital Economy and Society Index, and it shows us that in the area of integrating digital services, this is the poorest in terms of performance of a range of services in the digital economy in Europe. How, how then can you explain the European Government's decision to delay the abolition of roaming charges, data roaming charges, for another three years. Does that not give the wrong message to European consumers about our intentions to create a digital single market? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't call it as delay. But simply, these negotiations are, are moving, we should acknowledge, not very fast. As I, as I mentioned, there are a number of different stakeholders uh, well, we should take into account uh, interests of companies. Well, they, should, they shouldn't have losses, uh, but uh, in, in offering um, telecommunication services. But at the same time, uh, I think the European Commission has already, a number of years ago, have started to limit uh, roaming charges that, uh, well, 10 years ago, you may remember, they were enormous. Uh, if you were uh, traveling somewhere outside your own country, you were faced with, uh, well, probably maybe five or ten times higher roaming charges uh, than you were paid in, you, you were paying in, in your own country. Now, well, the, the, the goal is to align uh, roaming charges with, with national charges. Well, uh, but, but to achieve this, uh, a good compromise should be found. Uh, and, and a number, number of issues uh, of companies, of, of different member countries, should be taken, uh, taken into account. And, and, and that's the reason I, I don't, don't call, uh, I don't think that the Commission is somehow part, ha, delaying the whole process. Well, simply, there are too many actors around this issue, and, and therefore uh, this negotiation process is, is not as uh, as um, quick as, as maybe we would wish to have. But, but I think more important, and for us as a presidency, is more important to land to, to a good compromise, not to force one or other, other issue, but, but to get some, some uh, agreement uh, across 28. And, and therefore, I, I wouldn't say that it, it's somehow delayed but, uh, but simply the process is, 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 is quite complicated due to the fact that there are many actors and many stakeholders in uh, taking part. Um, my, my understanding is that the roaming charges were supposed to be abolished by the end of this year. 
and I was wanting to ask if during your country's presidency you will continue to press for that at the earliest opportunity so that consumers in Europe can get a better deal and that Europe can move towards a true integrated digital market that I'm sure we all support. Well, we, we, we really need to find, find a, a compromise. Um, uh, our goal is um, um, transactions be between service providers and, and service consumers uh, are safe and secure. And that's quite essential to take also into account the, the uh, aspect of, of security. We should also take into account um, aspect of personal data security uh, when, when we are uh, discussing uh, these, this package. We should take into account how we can fight cyber criminals uh, that are uh, not so few uh, in our time. So, well, there, there are really a number of, of different aspects on, uh, on the whole package. And, and um, well, services, uh, interests of consumers and interests of uh, service providers uh, are, are essential uh, uh, from both sides. Uh, and that's what we are, we are trying to find the most appropriate uh, solution. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Jimmy McGregor. Uh, thank you very much. Well, um, good morning, Ambassador. You're, in your talk, your very articulate talk, you've answered most of the questions I was going to answer. Um, but I, I, I'm pleased to see that you're hosting um, the Eastern Partnership Summit in Riga. Uh, what, what's your... Uh, um, in terms of the, the developments that have happened recently in the Ukraine um, and uh, your, your, your worries about security, um, what part do you see the Eastern Partnership playing in that? Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> when EU was starting its neighbourhood policy, that was late 90s, uh, and focusing uh, more uh, its orientation towards southern region and afterwards towards uh, eastern regions, uh, the goal, the ultimate goal, was, of course, first, economic development, and second, its security. And uh, having in mind that, and that's quite a legitimate approach to consider that democratic countries with responsible government with common market rules are more stable, more predictable, more reliable neighbors for European Union member countries. Well, that was probably the ultimate, to cut short, the ultimate goal of uh, European neighborhood policy. And, and uh, at the same time, it is a sovereign decision of, of any European state whether to choose such option or not. Well, and we see today that uh, Eastern Partnership policy is a very good example that European Union uh, is conducting policy based on free choice. Uh, and we see that there are front runners, three countries who have declared that they want to align with European standards, align with European values. And of course, if European Union is considering itself as a union of values, it should defend values and, and, and endorse these values if other countries want to align with these values. Uh, at the same time, if countries like Armenia or Azerbaijan or Belarus, they are maybe still hesitating and looking for different options, how, how they are shaping their foreign policy. It's a discretion to choose it. And it's not the European Union who are imposing, uh, somehow pressing them uh, to, to accept one single model. Well, one size doesn't fit all. And, and, and I think Eastern Partnership policy is the best example that it's not the case. Uh, but in general, uh, I think uh, democratic Ukraine based on rule of law, on uh, strong democratic institutions, 
based on market economy and rules that are observed uh, in, let's say, Poland and Ukraine and both sides of, of, the, of the border, it is in general interests of European Union, it is in general interest of Ukraine. But it is, again, it's a sovereign decision by Ukrainians. And, and they have, well, a year ago, they made their desperate attempt and desperate decision to turn to these European values, to, to, to come closer to, to Europe, European values. And I think it's a, a very much a obligation of European Union to be as much helpful uh, provide as much assistance as, as, as possible to Ukraine. So far, uh, it is a, a philosophy of uh, ISA partnership. And uh, I think uh, this is a pa partnership, even I can say bilateral partnership in a common frame between EU and uh, any of these countries. It's not uh, directed towards any other country, well, sometimes Russia is claiming that it's somehow directed against Russia. Well, it's not. Well, it, it's up to the European Union to shape its own foreign policy. European Union shouldn't ask, uh, well, neither Russia nor America, how, how to develop uh, the relations with Morocco or with Ukraine or with Egypt. Uh, it, it's a discretion of European Union to do. Uh, as well, well, Russia is not asking uh, European Union when, when it's implementing uh, projects of uh, Eurasian Economic Union, although it, it uh, does concern also interests of European Union, but it's this question of, of Russia or any other country. So it is we, we should honor sovereign decisions of states, and, and that's what European Union is doing. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I, I'm also delighted, you, you, you know, that you want to see, alongside the secure financial sector, you, you, you know, you want to promote growth and jobs. And, and, you know, you think that TTIP may possibly be a way of kick-starting, um, you know, um, a spark, in, you know, to lift the stagnation in the Eurozone, which obviously would make the Eurozone more attractive and European values more attractive as well. Um, on that case, we have the, um, the, the common agricultural policy, and I'm delighted to see that you, um, that Latvia um, would like to simplify the common agricultural policy. Uh, do you have any views on how that might be done? Uh, well, I, I think common agricultural policy demands uh, quite a sensitive discussion across all 28 member states. Uh, I we haven't envisaged uh, during our presidency some, some uh, very substantial shift in, in common uh, agriculture policy, uh, common uh, agriculture policy and financial framework of uh, common um, agriculture policy has been set uh, two years ago. Uh, and and uh, the basic uh, principles of, of financing uh, have been set. Well, we, we can consider that uh, by implementing of common uh, agriculture policy, we, we need to, to discuss uh, the reducing of administrative burden, reducing of uh, red tape uh, with regard to uh, common uh, agriculture policy. And uh, well, that what uh, um, in our plans of, of presidency, we, we, are, we have envisaged uh, Discussion, um, a discussion uh, in Ministerial Council uh, in, in March. Um, as well, we, we hope that uh, this discussion will be uh, continued in, in May. Uh, we, we are not um, about to, uh, well, somehow challenge or change uh, agreed decisions on uh, common uh, agriculture policy or on reform of uh, common uh, agriculture policy. Uh, but but we, we uh, want to make common agriculture policy more efficient. Uh, we have invited all the member states uh, to present their uh, proposals uh, where, in which, uh, which areas uh, the administrative burden uh, with regard to farmers could be reduced. And, and we are looking forward to, to advance with this discussion uh, to make uh, the life of the farmers more easy and, and not, not to burden them with, with too many uh, reports, papers, or, 
or, or um, any admi uh, other administrative uh, burdens. Yeah. Um, can I carry on? We've got, I've got two other members waiting, Jamie, if, right. if you don't mind, I'll bring you in. I just want a very small question then. Really um, quickly then, go on. Yes, oh, you, you mentioned uh, uh, one of the, the things about TTIP is, is, is worries about uh, food safety legislation. And you mentioned here advanced legislation, or, or this, it's, um, advancing legislation on food safety, and in particular on novel food. Um, do you see this as a problem with the, 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 via the US, which doesn't appear to have such strong um, safety precautions on, on food as, as the European? Well, I think uh, I think is food safety certainly is, um, and, and Commission uh, negotiation team knows it that food safety is a very sensitive across all the European Union member countries and, and certainly um, it, it, it is attaching a particular uh, attention to, to, to food safety and, and therefore uh, while well, it's also taking into account um, that the in European uh, Union member countries, the uh, attitude towards genetically modified products uh, is, is quite negative, and uh, I think that uh, is a point uh, that that is uh, taken taken into account uh, by by conducting uh, these uh, negotiations. Uh, also, uh, the issues of uh, uh, well production uh, safety, uh, the contamination of, of soil, uh, contamination of uh, environment, that's also issues that are affecting uh, food sa safety and food quality. And, and uh, these issues are also uh, taken um, into account. Uh, during our presidency, uh, we, we have envisaged in April in uh, uh, in, uh, in the Council uh, of uh, Agriculture uh, Council, we have envisaged a discussion about food safety and, and uh, genetically modified products. Okay, so we, we, we think that ministers will, will, will come to a, a proper position uh, defending the interests of uh, all the member countries. Okay, we're quickly running out of time. Rod Campbell. Good morning, Ambassador. I've got two kind of different points. One is in a helpful uh, submission prepared by Scotland Europa uh, in relation to your presidency. There is reference in the Justice and Home Affairs section to the creation of a bill of new psychoactive substances, legal highs, which is a subject that this Parliament's shown interest in. Are, are you able to help us with any more information on that? Legal highs? Oh, sorry, I... I couldn't understand. Could you um, it's a, a little bit it's, well, it's, louder? <laughs> Sorry. I, I'm referring to a Scotland Europa a submission in relation to matters affecting justice and home affairs. There is reference to data protection packages and the pursuit of fraud in relation to European financial interests, but there's also references to what's described as the creation of a bill of new psychoactive <laughs> substances. Is, is that anything you can help us with? If not, don't worry, I'll move on. I'm quite happy to move on if you were not able to add to that discussion. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. it, it, it's very, very specific, uh, specific issue. Uh, I, I probably could, could in this moment, I, I can, can okay. reply uh, rather generally that, yeah. of course, the consumption of of drugs and, and uh, uh, appearing of new type of, of drugs that are not yet listed uh, and, and still uh, are uh, presenting uh, high danger for consumers, uh, particularly among uh, young people. Uh, it is, it is uh, uh, on, on the top of uh, our agenda, and certainly our presidency will, will do its utmost to, to get the proper re regulations that, 
that is not affecting the health uh, and security of, of particularly young people who uh, and, and it's raising awareness uh, on, uh, on their knowledge on, <clears throat> on uh, consequences of, of, of such uh, use of uh, dangerous, uh, dangerous uh, drugs, uh, I, I can maybe find um, and, and send you uh, in, in writing uh, some, some yeah. more explicit uh, answer. Well, today uh, I, I yeah. could, could give only some rather general, uh, general answer. Yeah. Sorry for okay. that. My second point was in relation to CETA. Uh, I think you referred earlier on to the question of trying to get approval for CETA by the European Parliament. Um, uh, my understanding, last time I looked at this, and I might be a bit out of date, it was the European Parliament had only had one plenary session in relation to CETA. Um, obviously, there is considerable concern about TTIP uh, over here, and CETA, to some way, in some respects, kind of sets that path. Uh, are you able to help us with any further information on the process of uh, scrutiny of CETA at the European level? Well, our European Parliament is, is following really uh, very closely to negotiations of, of TTIP, uh, but we of course should take into account that uh, as soon the negotiations are conducted, uh, well, European Parliament can't uh, make any decision uh, on, well, neither on negotiation process nor on the result because there is no result yet. Uh, of course, European uh, Parliament will very carefully scrutinize uh, TTIP when the negotiation, uh, negotiations will be finished. But I think it, it's very important, and, and, and we, we as presidency have, uh, have had a, a very substantive dialogue with Euro European Parliament on issues on, on TTIP, and, and we are intending to continue with this dialogue uh, because uh, I think it's very important for a negotiating team to know what European Parliament is thinking about the whole process, uh, for instance, about uh, the level of transparency uh, of the negotiating process, so, so and where are the particular interests uh, of European Parliament uh, with regard to, to maybe uh, particular topics. Uh, but at the same time, we, we are uh, expecting now that uh, European Parliament will start ratification procedures of CETA, ah, right. of Canada Agreement. Yeah. Well, negotiations are finished. Now it's uh, European Parliament's job to do, to do its part. Right. So, and, and we, from our, our side, we, we as presidency are uh, trying to uh, move flexibly uh, this Canada Agreement uh, ahead in order to um, achieve uh, Parliament's uh, approval. Okay, I'll leave it there, I think, convener. Okay. Finally, Adam. Uh, thank you, convener, and uh, welcome, Ambassador. Like Scotland, uh, Latvia is a, a relatively small country in, in Europe. Uh, but unlike Scotland, you're, you're a member state of the European Union in your own right, and as I understand it, this is your first term as uh, or assuming the role of EU presidency. Could I ask what, what kind of impact that's had in Latvia uh, itself, assuming the role of EU presidency, uh, and what impact it's had on your international relationships? Well, I think uh, that that's really a very philosophical question, and thank you for it. Um, membership in the European Union for a small country, a country like Latvia, uh, gives enormous opportunities to uh, increase its global influence through the structures of the European Union, through the mechanisms of uh, relationship between European Union and other uh, countries and regions of the of the world, uh, and and therefore uh, in this respect, uh, Latvia as a small country is gaining gaining its uh, its importance in the world, and of course, assuming the uh, challenges of presidency, 
Uh, it is something particular, of course. Uh, it brings more knowledge in the world about our country. Well, we should recognize that probably uh, people in most of, con of uh, uh, countries of the globe are not waking up in the morning with the first thought, what's going on in Latvia? <laughs> probably not. Many of them really don't know where Latvia is, and that's an excellent, uh, an enormous opportunity to bring knowledge about, about uh, Latvia. So I'm, next Sunday, I'm, I'm going, I'm, I'm credited to Australia and New Zealand, I'm going uh, with a particular presidency program, uh, information program, to bring information to Australians and New Zealanders uh, about Latvia. We, we can use uh, this time of presidency uh, to increase knowledge about my own country, and we are happy about it. Of course, it, it costs quite a lot. Well, pre any presidency uh, costs millions and millions, but um, well, it, it costs also uh, very much engagement uh, and, and, and work. But Latvians are not afraid of work. Uh, they are happy to work uh, and work hard. Uh, so um, this is an enormous opportunity for, for a small country uh, to be more visible uh, on global scale. Uh, certainly, uh, we should somehow put aside our very strictly national interests, and, and we should work on achieving a compromise uh, among all 28 member countries. And uh, well, that's a sign of successful presidency. How? a country can achieve uh, an appropriate compromise among all the member countries, uh, not so much uh, how, how, adva how this country could advance their own proper interests, then it would be really uh, not the best presidency. But we, we are trying to do our best in, in promoting uh, the interests of the whole European Union. Well, I, I should say uh, these uh, common interests are very much in line with our national interests. Mm -hmm. So we, we are uh, working as well for our national sake uh, in, in uh, well, having a successful presidency. So it, it is a real challenge for us. That's the first presidency for, for Latvia. Uh, but I think we, we can cope with it. Uh, well, Latvians are are quite um, pragmatic, uh, well, they are more to the north and, and, and we are used to uh, not um, very favorable uh, nature conditions. Uh, we, we, we know that we should fight for ourselves permanently uh, to be strong uh, and I think that helps us also by conducting this presidency. Okay, well, thank you very much and we wish you every success. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> And on, on that note, uh, Ambassador, that, that concludes our time with you the, this morning. Can I, on behalf of the committee, thank you very much for a very, very comprehensive insight into uh, your presidency and the work you've already done and the future work that you have uh, in the pipeline. And as, as Adam Ingram said, we wish you every success in that. You, you're quite welcome to stay with us until we just conclude one final piece of business at committee this morning, and then we can have a formal introduction to the committee afterwards. Yeah. OK. Um, agenda item three is the Brussels Bulletin. Now, given that we have used up all of our time this morning, could I suggest if there's any uh, questions, queries, clarifications on the Brussels Bulletin, you direct those to the clerks. And we uh, forward the Brussels Bulletins to the rel relevant committee. Committee agreed. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we now suspend to go into our private session um, and I have to remind members we have a committee report to conclude this morning too. Um, and I thank you all for coming along and we'll see you at the next meeting. I now uh, suspend the meeting and go into private. Thank you very much.